we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios three folks from the post-prison education program and uh, going to be talking about uh, the work of the post-prison education program and a um, very special member that uh, has, was part of the organization and is no longer with us. Uh, so to get things going, we've got live in the studios, we are joined by Catherine Guzik, Don Verentes, and Joe Jensen, and uh, all with the organization. Thank you all three for coming in and uh, spending time with us uh, again here. Um, Catherine, uh, why don't you take it I away? I think that Don should definitely introduce post-prison education program. I know last month, on the same day, uh, Ari Khan was here, and he is the um, founder of post-prison education program. And I know Don Vrentis was the director of the post-prison education program, and she has a lot to add about um, what post-prison education program was. I mean, is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I've been involved with the post-prison education program since 2008. I first became involved with the program as a volunteer. Um, I was tutoring men and women coming out of prison, helping them get kind of up to par on their math skills or if they were already in college, tutoring them um, in algebra and, and other types of stuff. Then I became employed part-time and then I became employed full-time and eventually became um, the managing director up until 2014. Um, so the premise of the post-prison education program is essentially to work with men and women across Washington State, releasing from any of the prisons who are wanting to go back to school, whether it be vocational, trade, uh, university, community college, whatever that education looks like. For that individual, we help them um, in their transition, ideally starting to work with them six months to a year prior to their release, creating solid reentry plans, connecting them with resources, finding housing, um, kind of helping them put together all the pieces they need before they get out, because there's a lot to juggle after you're released from prison. And the prison system doesn't really release you with much other than uh, $40. So um, we set up that plan and then hold their hand as they come out and reenter society, get them onto the college campuses, connect them with counselors and um, financial aid advisors on the college campuses. Um, and again, it's across the whole entire state. So even though the program is located physically in downtown Seattle, we work with people across the state. Um, so wherever someone's getting released from, we will go and help them in that transition. And so then after they're released and they're enrolled in school, we continue to provide as much support as we can. And it's really individualized um, depending on, on what that person needs, whether they need help with, um, you know, past child support stuff or other legal stuff that they didn't take care of before they were incarcerated, um, help with getting connected to doctors or mental health treatment or going into drug patient treat drug inpatient treatment. So whatever that person needs, we really try to meet those needs, um, so that they can be successful. We provide financial scholarships as well. So we call it a gap scholarship, which means um, basically whatever um, their financial aid and their employment isn't covering, we kind of fill in that gap. So it might be just a bus pass and a cell phone, or it might be paying someone's rent for three to six months until they can do that themselves. Um, sometimes people don't have the financial aid right away because they have defaulted on student loans or other reasons that their financial aid hasn't come in. So we'll step in and, and pay people's tuition or, you know, pay people's loans so that they can be successful. The whole point is to, you know, get them into school, get them onto college campuses so that they have a better chance at not returning to prison. Are there any types of applicants that are more favorable 
in the program or selected? So the program really f wants to focus its time and energy on, I would call them the most vulnerable people. Um, so people who are categorized by the Department of Corrections as seriously mentally ill um, or having been incarcerated for a substantial amount of time. So people that we can kind of identify as not being able to succeed if we don't step in and intervene. So if someone is able to, to do this by themselves, um, they're more than welcome to come into the program and, and get help, but the finances are, are so limited that we really try to reserve the financial resources that we do have for those people who just wouldn't make it without us, who again, who have like serious mental illnesses or long terms of imprisonment or other extreme physical or mental barriers for their success. Okay. So, um, Joe, do you have anything to add about the program or how you got specifically involved with Ari and Joey? I got involved because my nephew was on his third incarceration and the first two were pretty much the blame game of, you know, bad legal advice, he wasn't guilty, all of that. And the third time he was in, there was a change that started to happen. And I started to hear about post-prison education program. Joey was classified mentally ill. Many of us, when we think of mentally ill people, think of somebody that is on the street, not managing. There's a look that we anticipate we would see, um, which isn't always true. And in Joey's case, he was very bright, very articulate. Um, he was a good looking man and he was mentally ill. And he started to realize that he was self-medicating and to self-medicate, you sometimes have to commit crimes to afford the drugs. And post-prison helped him start to look at what his demons were and for him to start taking control of himself. So post-prison got my total attention of what are you guys doing because you're doing something right when Joey started to claim his own life and get an education and move forward. So you'd agree that while Joey was in prison, they didn't have any specific services or resources for him that would help him? There were some, but not enough. And um, with the population, roughly 40% dealing with mental illness, um, the resources aren't there. The guidance isn't there. Um, so the first two times he was in, there was nothing that brought him out that had changed him. And that's why the recidivism rate is so high of people returning to prison. And their release to nothing. I mean, Joey was released to come live with me. I'm his aunt. Um, the first time was a year. I don't have the tools or I didn't have the understanding of what he was going through with his mental illness. Um, the second time he came out, he was angry. He was everything that people imagine when somebody's been incarcerated or caged. But the third time he came out, it was like, he had already gotten his associate's degree. He was going on to Washington State University. He made the dean's list. He was four point. He was hired for them by graphic artists. He claimed his life. For the first time, I saw Joey knowing joy. And you can't buy joy. Yeah. And then you, um, I mean, sorry, uh, Don, you were there when he first um, asked for an application to get into the program. What was that like for him and for you? Um, yeah, so I first met Joey. I was doing a presentation with two other students in Walla Walla um, in the maximum security section of the prison. Um, and he already had his application filled out, but was super shy. He wouldn't and if you ever saw him, he's, I don't even know how tall he was. He's a big guy. Yeah. Um, and I am not, I'm like 5'2", and he was scared to come up and bring his application. I remember that pretty vividly. And he, so he had his counselor bring up his application um, and the envelope, which I still have, was like, because he is a graphic designer, like he drew post-prison education so beautifully. And like even the envelope, he, you know, artistically designed to 
to be delivered. So, so his counselor delivered it to me. And then his counselor drug Joey over. So I got to meet him there. Um, and I started working with him right away, uh, primarily because he was in the AA program at Walla Walla. Um, they allow, I don't know how many men, but there was an AA program at the time. And we were traveling down to Walla Walla once a month to meet with people who are in that program and wanting to go on to pursue um, more education after their AA. So I was able to start working with them right away and then meet with them personally, you know, once a month and then also correspond um, over JPay, which is the prison email system um, with him. And he was, he was super passionate about what he wanted to do. Like he had already, you know, started the graphic design stuff at Walla Walla. He was constantly sending um, pictures of what he was doing there in their program. And one thing that stood out too to me when we would go and visit, he was not only like doing his own school, he was helping other people. Like I walked into a computer lab one time and he was like just buzzing around the whole room, helping other people um, you know, work on their stuff and designed. I don't know anything about graphic design, so it was like a foreign language to me, but um, you could just see the passion in his eyes about it and his enthusiasm because he was really helping other people um, and not just, you know, selfishly focusing on himself. So I continued to work with him for, I think, eight months um, before he was released um, in it's kind of just developing a plan for what he wanted to do when he got out and where he was going to live and uh, what school he was going to go to and uh, everything. Which was very different from when he had been released before. It was the phone call, hey, Aunt Joe, I'm getting out and do you have room for me? Which I did. And I did again. Um, and this time anticipating the date he was getting out was trying to figure out, so how do I help him? What do I do? What are my resources? Trying to shuffle all the anticipation of what was needed. And this time it was, uh, no, I got it covered. I'm going to WSU and I've got grants and post prisons helping me with housing and I'm going to have bus fare and they've, they've got it all laid out. And I'm like, wait a second, this is like unbelievable. And he said, no, it's not on you. It's on me. I am taking charge of my life. What, what powerful words are those to hear? Where do you think Joey found strength then at that time? I think education, really. I think when you really, I think he had to be, you have to be ready. And mm -hmm. he was finally ready to realize he was in this vicious circle and he was just going to keep repeating it. Um, that he was in charge of his life instead of the blame game yeah. of being able to, education gave him the opportunity, you know, you can classify people mentally ill and you can tell them they're mentally ill and you can do all those things, but that doesn't help. But when somebody gets some education and can really look at themselves and say, okay, this is who I am, that doesn't mean I'm not functional. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that I can't find my way into society. I'm just finding my way a different way. And post-prison was amazing in giving him that support and that guidance. I mean, an auntie can say, I love you forever. And, you know, I'm going to catch you when you fall within reason. Um, but when you have other people help empower you, it makes all the difference in the world of yeah. if you choose to grab it. And he was ready and they were ready to do it. Funding is so tough for any nonprofit, having worked with many. Um, you know, this is not a popular, people don't like to think of, but if they only realize the difference it can make in the world and changing instead of boarding people up, um, instead of using prisons as mental facilities and um, take a look at the difference that people can give by empowering them. And that's one of the things post-prison does for sure. I think Joey too also found something which we encourage every single student um, to do is to find something that they're passionate about. Um, and he did. And same with everyone else. And it doesn't have to be like a formal for your education. Like if it's welding that you're passionate about or culinary arts, 
uh, whatever it is that like makes you happy in life, we really, really encourage, you know, all the students to find what that is and to go after it and not to be worried about their past because it is empowering. And uh, I think the biggest thing that it does is it helps um, prison just kind of beats you down and society beats you down as a felon, as someone with a mental illness, as someone with a drug addiction. And coming out of prison, your confidence is is pretty low. Um, But if you are going to school and you're doing good things and getting good grades and doing something that you like, your confidence in yourself just boosts so rapidly um, that I think that that, I mean, with Joey and with all the people I've seen that have been successful with the program, I think that's the, the biggest thing is just being able to have confidence in yourself again and not feel, even though you might feel rejected by society, at least know that you're doing something good and uh, you can go on and do bigger and better things than going back to drugs and crime and all the other things that lead you back to prison. Yeah, I've personally never been incarcerated, but what I've heard, and it makes total sense, is that people don't realize that sometimes when what people need the most when coming out are the most frugal needs. I mean, how to get from one place to another, bus pass. They don't know how to get those resources, and it's super critical to, you know, that's the reason why post-prison education works is because they focus on meeting the frugal needs of what people, you know, need to have in their lives in order to get to a point of success whether that is, you know, going through the educational system or finding a passion. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like if you don't have those basic needs met, you're not going to be able to do do anything else really or become reach your full potential if you are worried about, you know, paying your rent or you you don't have a phone so you can't even you know, call back for job interviews, stuff like that. So that is a common saying that we meet people's legitimate frugal needs at the time they arise. So not like down the road, like if someone needs something right then and there, we really try to meet those needs right then and there and not leave people hanging because then they end up in situations where they might be trying to get money by other means or feel that they need to quit school Uh, because they can't afford certain things. So that's why the funding is so important so that you can, you know, meet those needs at the time they arise. Otherwise, (laughs) very quickly, the people will be back in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as we are talking, I mean, Joey has passed away. So what do you believe happened to, you know, get him into that point? Because we do talk about the positive parts, but it should be addressed I mean, what do you believe is the reason why? What failed him, I guess? I think two things failed him. His body failed him. His father had died of ALS. He started developing the symptoms. Um, He had seen his father suffer through that. And um, that's a pretty scary thing to look at that as your death sentence. And funding, um, one of the major funders for post-prison education um, was... I guess there's only one way that due to health reasons for herself, her funding to the program. And so as with any program, as I've said before, with nonprofits, it's really hard to keep that money flow going. And so some of the programs he had looked at or that wasn't attainable. So I think it was a combination of society failing him Mm -hmm. because why would we want to support people who had been incarcerated after all and um, his body failing him? So he chose to take his life. And yeah, so sorry, folks. Um, that's why I choose to give time to this program. I choose to donate to this program because we need to look at people as human beings and we need to keep giving them chances. Take it from me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I totally agree. You know, in society, I feel like people are marked by their mistakes and a lot of the time it people just believe they'll go back to the mistakes they've made and that they can't have a positive change in society and that they can't be a role model after they've made critical mistakes 
I think one of the hard things is as an aunt or a mother or father or whoever you are is we don't have the tools. I mean, as much as you can think that loving somebody might be enough or offering them shelter, it's so much greater than all of that. And I can look back at each time he stayed with me and I wish I knew what I knew today, which we should all look at our own lives that way. But post-prison was there for me when it was like, okay, Joey's living with me right now and I don't understand this, or I need help with this. And and they were there to answer my questions. They were there to help me with resources. Mm -hmm. They made that difference that I needed to help him also find joy that post-prison had helped him with major. Um, But for the first time, I felt like I really had a resource of being able to call somebody and say, okay, I need help. I don't need your money right now. What I need is emotional support of answering some questions of how can I be better to help him find his way. I never had that before. And um, so it's important that the people being incarcerated have that, but it's also important for the support people that are there that wanting to help also get some guidance too. And so they gave me that. Especially when people are doing, you know, long sentences when they get out. It's a totally different scenario. You know, technology changes, different resources that they need over time. You know, you forget once you're in there for so long. And Joey had been incarcerated four times. Mm-hmm. Um, so and he did, you know, them in, in the installment plan, but he did a significant amount of time. Um, and every time he was in there, he was diagnosed as a different level in their classification system, the Department of Corrections, like a different level of mental illness. Um, so the Department of Corrections doesn't really have a lot of resources either to deal with kind of those lower level, higher functioning people with mental illnesses. Um, so he was never really able, given the help, to deal with that. And when he did get out this last time, um, he, so I was working with him and he was, I was on the phone with him daily, multiple times a day, helping him because he was released to the Tri-Cities and our offices in Seattle, but I would talk to him on the phone daily, just walking him through where to get his bus pass, how to, you know, do this on campus, how to use Skype, like all these different things that he just didn't know how to do and was so overwhelming. Like it was overwhelming for me just trying to figure out all that stuff um, from a distance, you know, but I was more prepared to get on Google and make phone calls. Whereas he had been incarcerated for so long, he was overwhelmed just going to the grocery store or just going to the restaurants um, and making choices for himself. So I was able to kind of step in and help him with all that stuff. Um, And he, just like everyone else getting out of prison, just requires a lot of handholding in the beginning. And then once they're able to, you know, gain that confidence in themselves again and feel a little more stable, they can, you know, step in and help themselves out more. Um, But that initial initial time period is so crucial. I think the statistics say that most people who do recidivate, it happens in the first three months. If you make it past three months, then it's six months. If you make it past a year, your chances of recidivating um, go down pretty significantly. So that time period is crucial. And again, that's why the funding is so important because if we don't have, you know, the staff or the people to help someone being released during that time period, they're just going to go right back. What sorts of resources do you specifically, I mean, at the top, do you believe that prisons should incorporate into their systems? Um, In the systems while they're incarcerated, absolutely more like, mental health treatment there's not a lot of counselors or therapists available there's a lot of medications available um but like misdiagnoses happen quite regularly even if someone has been incarcerated previously they might come back and someone else sees them and so they get diagnosed with schizophrenia um and that's not really what they have but they'll start taking medications for that um or self-medicating there's a lot of drugs in prison, in case people didn't know there is a lot. So people will self-medicate. Um, and just the mental health treatment isn't available in the prisons. And people 
who have drug addictions, um, they might get some treatment while they're in prison, but the majority of people don't. Um, there's not, the capacity isn't, isn't there. Um, so if there was more help in the prisons or even just basic therapists, you know, for people who might not have a mental illness, but might have a lot of trauma in their background, um, a lot of other things to deal with, and then they're stuck in prison and don't really have a healthy way to deal with it other than sitting and just waiting um, for their time to be up. So, Do you believe the criminal justice system overlooks mental illness as being as powerful and as you know terrible as it is? Um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think they overlook it, but I don't think that they prioritize it in a way that they should. Um, do you know if the system is just uncomfortable with discussing mental illness, bringing in people that can talk about it or? I think it's very, I think it's more just crime specific. Um, so if someone has a sex offense, there's definitely counseling and therapists like they are required. The prison is required to put um, people who have committed sex crimes through certain levels and certain amounts of therapy. Um, so, you know, that that's a big thing. And those people are definitely prioritized um, to get that treatment because of their crime. People who have drug offenses and are court ordered, or if they have a DOSA, a drug, oh gosh, <laughs> I, I forget what it stands for. It's like an alternative sentence um, that the judici that the judge will give you. And so if you do get a DOSA sentence, you're required to do treatment, drug treatment as well. Um, and so those people will get chemical dependency treatment, whereas someone who might have the exact same addiction won't get it because they didn't get that sentence. So I think it just really comes down to what a person is sentenced to, what their crime is, and really like mental illness doesn't come into play unless that person isn't able to function normally in the general population. So if they are exhibiting behaviors that are threatening to themselves or threatening to other people, or they just they just can't physically function in with the rest of general population in the prisons, then those people will be in a separate unit, very segregated, or if they're suicidal also, um, then they'll be in a separate unit and given priority and given treatment and mental health counseling over people who can function normal. So my understanding is that uh, post-prison education program has a phenomenal success rate uh, in terms of recidivism. Is that true? Yes. Uh, the success rate is 92%, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. Correct. And uh, Washington State, it's 30%. And, you know, it's interesting because... I do talk to a lot of people about this issue, and what I hear is that a lot of people believe that, you know, we should be focusing on the people that are less mentally ill, that are um, less in need of maybe frugal needs than people that are extremely vulnerable at, um, to going back to prison, and, you know, that hasn't worked, and, you know, that's part of the reason why Ari's program is working, is because we are dealing with the people that are very likely to go back to prison. Yeah. So why isn't the st state or any other outside uh, force um, supporting programs like post-prison education program with a success rate like that? Because dogs at the pound are all more popular than prisoners. It's pretty hard for the state to take a stand um, and commit dollars when we're actually spending more dollars than we would spend if we actually invested in those people. But, um, you know, it's interesting for me when I talk about going into the prisons and talking to people, the reactions I get of, you know, are you safe or, you know, whatever. It's like it's always looked at like they're not human beings. 
So people want to run for office and they want to get voted in. So let's be popular. This is not a popular subject. This is not a subject that it's easy to get people to want to donate to. And yet, if you really look at it, not only are you saving a human being, you're also saving taxpayers a lot of money when you're, you're being proactive about what's going on. Um, Norway right now is being looked at as one of the best programs in the world where they look at when somebody's incarcerated as an opportunity. Isn't that a novel thought? An opportunity to help somebody turn their life around. That they look at it as a positive investment in someone's life instead of warehousing them. But our society is set up that we need to warehouse people that we don't want to be seen with, that we don't want to recognize, that we don't think they have value. Um, Hard to run for office on that campaign. And I think when there's so many, I mean, like, I just think of Seattle and, like, education and, like, wanting to fully fund education and, you know, other things. um, People want to give money to that and think that their money should go to like their own kids, like they want their kids to have an education. Why should their tax dollars be going to someone who's in prison? Um, It's the same reason, like in the prison system, there used to be, so you get paid 42 cents an hour, but there used to be other jobs in the prisons where prisoners had an opportunity to make like a dollar or even $3. But those jobs got taken away because people in society found out about it and they thought that those jobs should be available to citizens and not people who are in prison. And they weren't like, like in the I can speak to the women's prison because I know that better. Um, But jobs, they were like sewing jobs, like sewing clothes, like different things or putting together office furniture, like not major huge jobs, but they were jobs that, you know, we're giving the women skills. We're giving them work experience. We're giving them money to be able to buy things for themselves. Because um, you do have, like, the prison doesn't provide you everything that you need, especially women. Like, they have to buy their own tampons. The prison doesn't provide that type of stuff for them. So they, like, and a lot of women would take their money and send it out to families or, pay off their legal and financial obligations. Uh, So that's giving right back to society. But um, I think that people, unless you want to delve into the prison system and learn more about it, uh, it's just, I don't, people just go off of what they think and think that all the people in prison are in prison for whatever and all the stereotypes that go along with it. So yeah, it's not, it's not a very popular thing to provide money for or want to fund yeah even with politicians i mean if they were to focus on you know resources i mean supporting programs like post-prison education program you know society would look at them a little strange and they wouldn't want to vote them in you know especially if they're vulnerable to you know being new as a politician then they would you know suffer badly so you know As sad as as it is, I mean, that's also part of the reason why. Well, my understanding too is there there are definitely even in the the um, state prisons that uh, are not private. um, There's still companies that are making a lot of money off the prisoners and and the families too, which always gets left out uh, of the equation. You know, in addition to the people that are are in the prisons, there's also they, they generally are connected family members that um, are enduring um, having to, first of all, they've lost their, in a lot of occasions, they've lost, you know, a, a breadwinner. Um, they, um, you know, there's children that are being impacted on this. A lot of people in prison uh, leaving children behind. Um, it's phenomenal costs that aren't being added into the equation at all here. One of those costs is exactly what you're talking about, the children. Having done foster care and violent offender foster care licensed through the prison system is the percentage of children raised by families where a family member was incarcerated. Their chance of also ending up being incarcerated is extremely high. So absolutely, the the victims are much wider than just the person that's incarcerated. Um, It's We've got to redo our system. And programs like post-prison need support. And if 
anybody would like to send them a check tonight or tomorrow or go onto their website, please do so because funding for this program is very hard to get and it changes lives. And when you can actually witness lives being changed, it's pretty amazing. And that's why I'm involved. Yeah. I think the, I mean, you can go on the DOC website, but I think it's like 89% of people incarcerated have 2.4 kids. Like that's just how it, how it works out. But uh, so, I mean, that's a huge percentage of people who are parents. So that's a lot of kids out there whose parents are incarcerated. And then the parents get out and are expected to jump right back in and be mom or dad again because grandma and grandpa are tired of taking care of the kids. And so they want to hand them right back over. And they're just trying to get their feet back on the ground. Um, so we have, you know, help families reunite is a huge part of the program because most of the people do have kids and will help um you know, pay for rent and pay for transportation so that moms and dads can be with their kids again and help that transition go well. And and while incarcerated, and Joe, I'm sure you can speak to this too, how much it costs just to send one of those JPAYs that I referred to earlier, even to send an email, it costs. Um, you have to buy a stamp. So, and it adds up. I mean, it's not a huge amount, but if you're sending emails regularly to stay in contact, that adds up. Um, so that program or that company is definitely profiting. And phone calls are ridiculous. I don't know what your phone call was, bill was, Joe, but I'm sure it was it was high. And if you want to travel to visit people, man, the the men's prisons are all over the state. Like you could be out in Aberdeen or Walla Walla or Connell or all the way out on the peninsula traveling across the state to see your husband, your wife, your son, daughter, whatever it is, that's that's super expensive. And very, my understanding is very narrow windows on when you can visit. Yeah, yeah, very narrow windows. So like, you know, a couple days a week, um, normally three or four days a week and a couple hours um, at a time, maybe like a four hour visit. So did Joey have any kids? Yes, he had a son um, that when Joey passed away was five years old and he was being raised by an aunt of the mother and the mother was also incarcerated. And um, I helped facilitate that adoption. And yeah. So. That was one of his focuses when he got out also, like trying to go not only to school to get, you know, he was had the idea of getting employment eventually, but getting his housing, um, getting his mental health, like his medications in order, getting to a doctor. Um, but he did have a son that he wanted to establish a relationship with. And we, we practiced Skyping because he was so nervous. He was going to have like a Skype visit with his son who was in Texas, I believe, at the time. Um, and he was so excited to get to be able to do a video call or a Skype call um, with his son. So we would practice Skyping. And he was working towards that. Like he talked about it regularly, wanting to be able to, um, you know, find a, a place for him to live that he could have another room for his son. So it was always in the back of his mind. But, you know, knowing that he needed to be doing well and, and have a school and have a good job and have a safe place place for his son to come um, was definitely one of his priorities and something that he was wanting to do. And I think that's true love. When you look at what's best for your child, not what's best for you. And he was able to sit back and do exactly what you talked about, Don. It's like, I've got to get myself established. He's in a good family. He's in a safe family. Um, he ended up up in Washington where he could see him occasionally but he knew that to just jerk him out because that's what he wanted was not the right thing for his son. Um, you know, we think, and again, I'm going to go, you know, Joey was mentally ill, um, but how many parents are that smart to say it's about my son and the security of my son, and I don't want my son to go down my path and to be able to set that example to say, 
I want a solid life and I want to work on a relationship. But the relationship doesn't mean I jerk him out and take him in. I need to get set up. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, a huge struggle for a lot of people I've seen coming out who want to step back in and be mom and dad right away. They want to make up for lost time. They don't possibly have the best parenting skills because they were doing whatever they were doing that led them to be incarcerated when they were mom and dad and the kids are angry, you know, dealing with their own emotions. So it's just such a vulnerable, tough situation because the kids want to be with mom and dad, mom and dad want to be with the kids, but it's, it just has to be done really slowly and right. And it's hard for mom and dad that come out that have kids to kind of swallow that pill and realize that they can't be that role in the kid's life right away. So recently one of the stories was one of um, the guys got out in and out for three or four t- visits and his daughter was 18 and she said each time my dad came out, he wanted to do this relationship and she said I could look at him and, and know he's short term, he's going back. It isn't, it's like my heart has been broken so many times. Um, he's, out now, post-prison education is helping him find his way. She's actually moved down to be closer to him. She's 18 now. And she said, the first time I can look at my dad and know he's going to make it. He wants to make it. He has the support. He's going to go somewhere. She's 18 and for the first time is feeling like she has a father. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why post-prison education program is different because so many programs do focus on children, but there's not enough programs that focus on the parent in order for a child to be successful. A lot of the time they need a role model and, you know, having the support and the resource from a post-education program um, is wonderful. You know, it's, it's vital to a child's success almost, you know? Yeah. Um, I also uh, read that Joey was um, producing a newsletter and or a blog. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Go ahead. He was so excited about this too. So, And he started doing it right away um, when he got out because he really, like I mentioned earlier, he was in the computer lab like helping people with stuff. But when he got out, he started yeah, he called it a newsletter and he and it was like a newsletter and he would send it back into his friends and into the prison on a regular basis to just encourage them. And he was super honest in it. I think that that was, you know, one of the greatest things about Joey and a key factor in people that are going to be successful is you just have to be humble and vulnerable and admit that it sucks and it's hard and admit that you're like where you mess up. So he would write and, you know, was honest with the people who are still incarcerated about what he was doing, what was hard, what was good. Um, And he just was sharing his his journey as he got out um, with the people who were still in just as a way to encourage and motivate him. Um, And it was, it was like, I mean, I got feedback from people who were getting it about how great it was. Because it's important for people who are on, who are still incarcerated, to hear those stories um, of people who are being successful. Because, like I said, it's super discouraging, especially if someone has been in three or four times to just be like, "Well, I'm just going to come back anyway." So, having those people who have, who have been where you've been and who have changed and are showing that it is possible to change and that it is possible to have a successful life and not go back um, is super important. And I know he was really passionate about sharing that and encouraging people. And I think one of the differences was, I think the other times when he got out, part of him believed he'd go back. I think there was always the um, not having value of himself, not knowing what to do. Um, Again, no matter how much I could tell him I loved him or I'm there providing shelter and food, you know, because if you feed them enough, everything's going to be okay. But that's not true, I'm finding. Um, But this time when Joey got out, you could tell he wasn't going back. He had figured it out. 
and he wanted to share that with others to give them hope. And when he stumbled, he let them know that. And I know one of his great prides he had shared with me, and I think in the newsletter, is he went from a bus pass to a bike. And wow, that was huge that he had his own transportation. And, with and the I mean, cape. Yeah, yeah, right. And it was just like the simplest, purest things that you can find joy in when you allow yourself to and when you're given the opportunity um, from a bus pass to a bike. Think what that would do for you. Would you be happy about that? Trust me, you would be if you had been restricted in your freedom prior. Yeah. So I know post-prison education program goes into prisons and talks directly with um, prisoners. Um, How do you think that changes their perspective um, about the program? And, you know, when they're about to, a lot of them are about to, you know, be released. And do you think they, you know, get more hope from seeing post-prison education program and how have you directly, I guess, influenced them and, you know, how have you uh, interacted with them during that process? I think it definitely uh, provides a lot of hope um, for people. When you're sitting in prison, like you have a a lot of time to think about, you know, what you might want to do. You know, you, I mean, everyone has dreams and things that they want to do with their life um, and not, People don't just sit in prison and dream about coming back to prison. So us going in and doing these presentations um, is super important because it it just kind of sheds light on what people might already be thinking. Like they sign up to come to the presentation. No one's forced to come to the presentation. So it's people who are toying with the idea of going back to school or they have ideas and dreams of of something that they want to do different when they get out. So when we do the presentations, it is, you know, kind of a logistical layout of the program and what we can do. But also every time we go back in, we take people who have been through the program, who are success stories um, and have, you know, been incarcerated, gone back to school and are now successful. Um, And these people may have gone back three or four times and messed up, um, but eventually they got it right. So we're able to share those success stories um and it's super encouraging i I think that we always get great feedback uh the staff generally likes us there because we are providing a positive message to people we're providing them yeah hope like you said um and just and just in sharing your story it's amazing experience um i went last month to monroe there were 93 gentlemen there and they were fully engaged. They listened, they asked questions, um, individual questions, group questions. Um, I mean, I have never seen that much attention being given in a junior high or a high school, trust me. (laughs) Um, But they hung on every word and and they had valid questions. And and my story is about being Aunt Jo and what it's like to be on the outside and trying to figure out the path. And the greatest compliment to me as I walked around later was, hey, Aunt Jo, hey, Aunt Jo, asking me questions and things like that. So they were listening. They were engaged. They weren't just showing up to fill in a couple of hours. They were hungry and thirsty for information that might change their lives. And to be able to stand there and witness that is so heartfelt that you can understand why we're here today. Yeah, most of the stuff when you're in prison, you don't, you're not hearing positive stuff like you're just you're being told what to do and what not to do and all your choices are made for you so you don't get to choose what time you go to bed what you eat what you wear like all your choices and your freedom are taken away um so when someone comes in and tells you and kind of flips that script and is like well what do you want to do what do you want to do with your life and you get to choose that um it's it's really empowering to be able to hear that I don't share my story a lot when I go in there, but I was incarcerated um, for a significant period of time. And though I didn't go through the post-prison education program, I went back to school um, right when I got out um, and now have my master's degree. And uh, education really turned my life around um, and has helped me overcome the felony that I have on my record. so I share a little bit about that sometimes and just how education can help you 
um, get your life back on track and you you can do bigger and better things than just just being a prisoner like the felony doesn't have to prevent you from doing what you want to do um, in most cases so um, since post-prison education program does have a limit limited amount of funding and you know you probably get a lot of applicants for the program what would you tell people that are you know they've they've kept applying and they haven't gotten to the program how do you keep you know when you go in there and they've said that how do you keep them hopeful you know and give them hope so that when they do get released they can find their path possibly and not re-enter the criminal justice system um i think that yeah i mean i don't even know how many applications come in the mail a week anymore but it's there's a lot there's like uh, and I don't have the numbers, but hundreds of applications and hundreds of people who are released from prisons every single day who are wanting help. Um, and the staff is super small. Volunteers are great, but the the financial capacity just isn't there to help everyone that needs the help. Um, but I would say that the help is there, like getting guidance and getting help. And like, even if the program can't provide the financial support, um, they're there to help like me, like I was there to help tutor people. Um, so there's help, you know, if you don't know where to go on campus, we generally can call someone we know on campus and help you get kind of directed in the, in the right way. So it's not even just about the finances. Um, if we can't help you out financially, we can help people out with the other type of help that they need with just navigating and maybe connect you to a different scholarship that we might know about or connect you with um yeah someone on campus that could help you do you know if the application process is very tedious or is it pretty simple it's not as tedious as like a college application uh it's pretty straightforward um you are asked questions like basic demographic information but then also, you know, you're asked to be pretty upfront about any mental health issues, any addictions, um, if you have been to chemical dependency treatment, stuff like that. Because, and if you're not honest, you can tell like pretty quickly if someone is not being honest, if they're in, like, we can look at your crime and see what you're in there for. And if you think that, you know, <laughs> Like some people won't admit that they have a substance use disorder when clearly they've been to prison five or six times for possession, um, you know, that might be an issue. So as long as people are just super honest with those questions, um, you know, or ask if you have kids or if you have any, you know, other legal issues that we might be dealing with just because we want to be able to provide the best support we can for you. And if we don't know that you have a mental illness or we don't know that you have three kids in foster care, um, we're not going to be able to help you out. And then the biggest portion of it, I guess that, well, biggest in the way that it would take the most effort is just a personal essay. Um, and that doesn't have to be long. Um, but again, the program just wants you to be honest and open. And we want to know that you that you want an education and that the investment that we make in you is going to be worthwhile like if we don't think that someone is ready to go to school or that they um how do you know that i mean how do i think you can just kind of gauge like you know if and we'll help anyone out again it just comes down to the finances and if you're able to get a financial scholarship it is you know the finances are so limited that um it's just you can't help everyone but it's like any college you know scholarship that you're going to apply to um, the scholarship committee reads your essay looks at all your information and looks at all the other hundreds of applications and essays and just kind of has to gauge who would be the best recipient of that funding from my understanding I also note that housing is a pretty big problem with you know, prisoners coming out of the system. Do you have a lot to say about that? Yeah. 
<laughs> housing is like the worst. I that was like my biggest struggle in helping people come out um, was finding housing. Seattle now doesn't have the box on the housing applications, which is pretty cool. Um, but I don't know. Sometimes they, the box. Oh, the bot like <clears throat> on an application, you have to check if you have a felony or not. Um, and so they got rid of that on housing applications. I don't remember when, but, um, but still, I mean, it's hard, uh, to find housing, <coughs> especially the funding is, I mean, how's the, it's a housing crisis in Seattle anyway. So if, if you have a felony and you're coming out and you have no money, you're coming out and dealing with the same stuff the rest of the homeless people in Seattle are dealing with. So we try to place people in like Oxford houses, um, which is they're like big houses, maybe seven or eight people. And you rent a room for 450 or $550 and it's they're clean and sober houses. So you're going to AA or NA meetings you're in a house with other people who are in working on their sobriety. Um, so we really encourage those just because it's, you know, financially easier and you're going to be ho hopefully living with other people who are staying clean and sober um, and not be tempted to use drugs. Um, otherwise, just getting really creative, trying to find maybe, you know, shared housing and other resources or, um, yeah, it's, it's hard. From my understanding, the housing is pretty decent though. It's not terrible, right? The conditions aren't. The, not yeah, like the Oxford houses are, are decent. Um, if, you know, if you come out and you have, the two crimes that you like absolutely finding housing is nearly impossible is if you have an arson or if you have a sex offense, um, finding people housing in there, the only housing available to them is, is pretty, pretty bad. And what happens to people if they do relapse into drugs since there is such a, um, I guess there are restrictions. They're pretty, you know, well, we've, I mean, we have people in the program relapse. I mean, it happens. It happens all the time. Um, and so we don't kick people out of the program for that, but we want them to, we work with them to get them into treatment, get them assessed, get them into inpatient, outpatient, um, whatever it is to get them sober. Uh, but if they're in an Oxford house, you automatically get kicked out. So that poses problems, but what we were, I mean, we're there to help people through whatever struggle they're, they're dealing with. And uh, like so many people have substance use disorders that dealing with relapses isn't uncommon. So how do you, both of you, John and, and <laughs> uh, me, John, Joe and Don, um, want Joey to be remembered? We both got quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I want him to be remembered for strength and empowerment and that's what he wanted for other people and um, if he had survived he would be helping other people up based on his past and not ashamed of it but using it to stand on not drag it behind him and to help others find their way yeah that's perfect um i yeah i would just hope that people would remember him for the passionate, determined um, man that he was. He was so giving with his heart um, and and struggled a lot. And um, like Joe mentioned, you, you couldn't see it. Like if you looked at him, you wouldn't know that he was struggling. Um, so just to be gentle with people and um, know that everyone has their past and their struggles, but they're not just throwaway people. Yeah. Sometimes the quietest people are struggling the most, as we have seen yeah, in society. So how can people find out more about Post-Prison Education Program? You can go to their website, Post-Prison Education Program, and there's a donate button there. You can also learn more about them. Um, they need volunteers. Money is always important. Um, regretfully, it would be nice to think it wasn't, but that's how these things are funded. And it can be as simple as helping somebody get a bus pass or a bike, 
or housing, which is huge, um, to have staff to be able to hold a hand and help them find their way. So if you can find in your hearts to donate, we appreciate it. It does make a huge difference in a human being. All right. Well, thank you all for coming in. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Looking forward to the show again next month. <laughs>